Unlikely starting point for this discussion is the plastic ice cream container. This is what inspired my years of research, my years of study and writing and speaking about military medicine and the Australian Army Field Ambulance Units. So on telling my father in 1990 that I was going back to study history, Dad went into his bedroom and reached into the back of his wardrobe and he came out with this container and he plonked it on the table and he said, well, if you're studying history, you better have a look at this. And that was the trigger for everything that followed. It held my great uncle's war diary, dog tags, his Red Cross brassard or armband, his service medals, and a few pieces of correspondence. So over the next couple of years, with tr trusty magnifying glass in hand, I transcribed that tiny handwritten entries in Uncle Nick's diary. So the descriptions of the sights and sounds and smells of the places he visited were evocative, and the tales he told left me wanting to know more. So Lawrence Nicholas, or Nick Kennedy, which is on this side, far side, he was born at Wyong, down the road, in 1916 and died in 1976 at the age of 60. His older brother Bill was born in Newcastle in 1908 and he died in 1957, aged just 49. During the 1930s, they both worked at what was then known as the Pete and Milson Island Mental Hospital Facility on the Hawkesbury River. Bill was a laundryman and Nick was a nursing orderly. And a few months after the Second World War broke out, the brothers traveled by train to Sydney and enlisted in the Australian Army on the 27th of May, 1940. And for the next five years, they served together as nursing orderlies in the second fourth field ambulance. So after months of hard physical, practical and theoretical training in Australia, the brothers embarked with their unit on the Aquitania in October, 1940, on their way to the Middle East via India. Nick's diary describes some of his experiences. So in April 1941, he wrote, spent 25th birthday in the Western Desert. In Egypt, we passed through several prison camps where there were some thousands of Italian prisoners of war. Left Palestine on the 11th of April for Egypt. Then we took up our location in the desert. Dust storms every day, sand and grit in everything. And he talks about rejoining the unit in June and talks about how from the Western desert, the ambulance journeyed over to the Syrian border and were dispersed amongst the olive groves, took up their position overlooking the Sea of Galilee on the Syrian border and went into action on the 12th of June. The first day of our arrival, enemy aircraft machine gunned the road around our position causing casualties. So his diary writings add to our understanding of the events by giving us a personal perspective. So in December 1941, he wrote the following. Japan declared war on the 7th of December. Christmas brings another Christmas abroad to us. And Christmas day in Syria was a bleak cold day and New Year's day even colder still. 1942 looms in front of us. We look back on 1941 with its various happenings and no one would care to live it over again on this side of the world. We all feel confident that 1942 is going to be a more victorious year than the one past. We see the old year out and the new year in in an Arabic cafe in Elmira, Syria, which was near Tripoli. So I think the words are all the more poignant because we know what unfolded in 1942 and the suffering that a lot of these men would experience. So both men served their time with the second force until the whole unit was demobilised at the end of the war. As a historian, I didn't want to examine their experiences in isolation. I needed to understand the bigger picture. Lucky for me, the army likes record keeping. So my trips to the war memorial over the years have uncovered a wealth of information. In January, my first book, Shadows on the Track, was published with some support from the Australian Army History Unit. So it was based on my PhD, but I had to modify it to make it a, hopefully a bit more readable. So I'm now looking into the medical aspects of the rest of the war from 43 to 45 in the islands. And they're often referred to as the mopping up campaigns. But I think if you look behind the story, it was a bit more than mopping up. And I'm a bit worried about the implication of what that meant, what we were mopping up. But I guess my key question is, did we learn anything? from the 1942 medical campaign. So I guess my key argument, which I set out to see if I was on the right track, so to speak, was that not all of the medical challenges that were encountered were inevitable or unavoidable consequences of the environment. And many of the challenges were in fact predictable problems that arose from decisions made and not made. And many of the problems often had simple and practical solutions. So this is just a quick summary to look at some of the key uh, medical issues that the medical men confronted. Each of these aspects influenced and then was in turn influenced by the other factors listed here. So if we consider the issue of 
priority. The supply of aeroplanes and aeroplane parts were given a A1 priority. Medicine and medical supplies were given a B8. Materials for the construction, repair and maintenance of hospitals to be used for military purposes were deemed to be a B15 priority. So that's pretty obvious when you're fighting a war, you're going to prioritise the munitions, planes and those sort of things. But just to give you a perspective of where medical fitted in that priority list. So again, from a military viewpoint, that decision to prioritise the number and the proximity of boots on the ground over the health of the soldiers probably made good sense in the short term. But from a medical perspective and from a long-term military perspective, the approach really didn't make much sense. Not everyone held the same view when it came to these ideas about treatment and priority. Some medical officers begrudgingly accepted the situation and others more stridently expressed their views. And I think that just reflects the fact that war's ultimately about people. Some guys went with it and barely questioned it. Others really champed at the bit and fought all the way. So these few lines are from a report on medical services in jungle warfare written by Colonel George Maitland, who was the um, Assistant Director of Medical Services at Milne Bay. So he takes quite a pragmatic and diplomatic approach to the relatively low priority that was given to medical services, but others saw things quite differently. It's funny how when you're doing history, you get attached to certain characters. And this guy, who to, was known to his colleagues as Frantic Freddy, apparently. He had good reason to be frantic, I think. <laughs> but this was an extract from a personal letter that he wrote to his brother, who was also a doctor, and his brother was in Sydney. The letter describes the critical situation that arose at Myola in October and November, when that site's supposed suitability for aerial evacuation of over 400 Australian casualties was tested and failed. Though the repercussions of the failure continued all the way to the beachhead because the second six field ambulance was meant to proceed with the second fourth, the one that Bill and Nick were part of, to supply the medical uh, care and they had to wait at Myola because that wasn't cleared until December of its casualties. So that quote always gets me. You can just hear the frustration with that last line. God forgive the blind, stupid people who are responsible for such a state of affairs. And basically, the fighting had moved on and they were left there. Full Strength Field Ambulance has between 10 and 12 medical officers and 224 other ranks. There wasn't a time during this whole campaign that any of the soldiers were supported by a full, fully functioning, fully staffed, full strength field ambulance. So the officers, as I say, were predominantly medical officers, but sometimes they were dentists, and the dentists often performed the role of the anaesthetist. So their role was to treat sick and wounded soldiers, and their aim was to get them back to the front line. But if they couldn't do that, they had to evacuate the casualties back through a series of medical posts, um, regimental aid posts, dressing stations, right back to the general hospital. So that's what the field ambulance was. So let's consider who they were. So I've given you a little bit of background of my great uncles, but not all of the personnel were directly involved in medical work. They might have been responsible for constructing the dressing stations or driving the vehicles. And the men came from a variety of backgrounds, city, country, young, old, married, single, educated, barely literate, skilled, unskilled. Tram conductors, wharfies, bullockies, clerks, shopkeepers, laundrymen, as well as the psych nurses who formed the medical corps. They're the people who made up the second fourth, for example. So those appointed as nursing orderlies generally had some sort of connection with medical care and civilian life, but nursing was still very much seen as a women's work. Um, so they often copped it from both sides. The female nurses quite resented having to treat these rough male orderlies and tell them how to do their job in the hospitals. And the fighting soldiers often made derogatory comments towards them because they weren't seen as fighting men. They weren't, they weren't in the battle, they weren't front line. I suspect that might have changed when they were on the battlefield unarmed, patching them up. But, but eventually, you know, they did earn the respect, obviously, but they didn't have it easy. So Nick described on the 14th of October, we headed for Myola. We set out in various groups of three and five. The track from here seemed to get worse. The black, evil-smelling mud halfway up our legs in lots of places. On the steep ridges, steps that had been cut in had broken away with the continuous tramping. So it left wet, slippery slopes to clamber up, which was no easy task. To move along without the help of a stick was impossible. You'd find yourself more time slipping over than on your feet. One hand had to be free at all times to cling onto vines or to make any kind of way at all in those parts. So the medical officer that we heard from earlier, George Maitland, explained the field ambulance was essentially a mobile unit and in jungle conditions they needed to be more elastic. 
than normal, but unfortunately that was really limited in Papua for several reasons, not least of which was the ability to move thousands of pounds of equipment across difficult terrain. So while it's not the focus of my discussion today, I did want to acknowledge the role played by the Papuan population in the care of the sick and the wounded Australian soldiers. So the local Papuans were recruited by ANGAL, which was the Australian New Zealand Administration Unit, and they were subjected to exhausting work under arduous conditions. You might know them by their nickname of the so-called Fuzzy Wuzzy Angels. But what's important to note is that their work as supply carriers and stretcher bearers did prove invaluable and saved lives, but they were initially recruited for the forward transportation of supplies. They were never meant to be carrying the casualties. So that fact alone, I think, tells us a bit about the medical priorities of the army. The decision to backload the Papuan carriers with casualty was born of necessity. And it arose because for most of their campaign, there just was no effective means of evacuation. So in the Owen Stanleys on the Kokoda track and at the beachheads, it was the doctors, medical orderlies and other ranks of the field ambulance that were forced to improvise in terms of treatment and equipment to save lives. But their actions were underpinned by a series of basic medical principles and actions. So despite some improvements as the campaign progressed, the lack of prioritisation and preparation continued well into the final months with issues around supply treatment and evacuation causing unnecessary suffering. But it wasn't just the wounds that caused suffering, but sickness and tropical diseases such as malaria, dysentery and scrub typhus. As my uncle Nick explained, he wrote, we reached Saputa at 1.30 p.m. on the 21st of November. There's a flat clearing beside the river with palm trees fringing the background. Casualties are heavy here and our ambulance men are doing a great job. 36 hours sometimes and no sleep or just get an hour where possible. Most of us are sick with malaria, some with dysentery and a lot with both. But our wounded are suffering from this too, as well as some of the ghastly wounds we have. The second fourth has wilted down in numbers and most of us have lost two or three stone over the past three, few weeks. Rations have been short and sometimes none, but we're still in hope of something good turning up sooner or later. There's talk the 25th will be pulled out as all the units are low in numbers now owing to the heavy casualties. And Nick and Bill both suffered from repeated bouts of malaria during and after the fighting, and indeed long after the war had ended. My dad remembers my uncle Nick still suffering from the, from the shivers, the tremors. So amazingly, the soldiers themselves were often blamed for contracting malaria. And some senior officers were of the opinion that malaria should be regarded as a self-inflicted wound because in their argument it was caused by the soldiers' lack of discipline and their failure to take medication and their failure to wear appropriate clothing, or they argued some were deliberately catching malaria in the hope of being transferred back to Australia. But if that self-inflicted idea is to be given credibility, I think we have to then overlook the realities of fighting a medical campaign up there. Um, Australia was long responsible for the territory of Papua and their health care but it was long neglected as well. And there was lots and lots of studies done over the years. Uh, authorities well knew the malarial nature of the country, the devastating effects of it on the locals, as well as its potential to decimate the army. So, in my opinion, blaming the soldiers for contracting malaria also means that we have to ignore the army's continued failure to adequately respond to the reports and to address crucial and relevant concerns, such as the regular rotation of personnel, their failure to ensure the consistent procurement and effective distribution of anti-malarial drugs and other measures such as spraying or nets, to regularly evaluate the effectiveness of the treatment regimes, to provide enough beds in, the well in enough well-equipped hospitals, and to basically plan, organise and execute safe and regular and reliable means of evacuation to the mainland and access to com comprehensive treatment. So then you've got the surgery situation as well, besides the medical. So it's fair to say that during the first frantic weeks of the campaign, medical and surgical care range from non-existent to rudimentary, and opportunities to promptly operate on major battle wounds were virtually non-existent. So by the time the beachhead battles were fought around Bunagona and San Ananda during November and December and into January 43, the frontline surgical situation had improved and the treatment procedures that were intended to be followed during periods of fighting generally worked well. 
But over the course of the campaign, the key question was um, whether it was better to take the casualty back to the surgeon and so away from the immediate danger of battle or to bring the surgeons forward to the casualty and therefore put them and the patient at greater risk. The words of Private Kennedy add to our understanding again of how theory didn't always match the reality of battlefield surgery. And his description of conditions at the Myola dressing station in October 42 adds some depth and colour to the black and white photographs like the one that's here. So he wrote right, that we're collecting lots of wounded. The surgeon, Captain Leslie, who's in this photograph, is working 18 hours a day. He talks about how the operating theatre is located and what it's made up of. It looks pretty rough. Operating tables, a wooden bench built from a pole. Some of the most complicated operations are performed, abdominal wounds, amputations, and severe head injuries. More than busy attending to our wounded, 14, sometimes 18 hours without a break, but no one cares. These chaps are deserving of the best we can give them and more than grateful for the assistance rendered them. Some of these wounds are terrific. One wonders at time how the human body can live being mutilated like some of these poor fellows, but one cannot express his feeling towards them. We've got to try and keep them cheerful, but that's a hard job under these conditions. And in that last section, he talks about the medical gear that's dropped by parachute. And he says, we don't stint the use of morphine here. And a lot have two or maybe three injections to ease their pain. A quarter of a grain of morphine about every four or five hours. It's pretty much all they could offer them, I think. So as they move forward towards the coast around the 18th of November, the bulk of the second six field ambulances I mentioned earlier is still back at Myola. So the care of the advancing soldiers is primarily up to the second fourth. He, Watson, was given the unenviable task of persuading the Australian and the American pilots who were landing plane loads of weapons in readiness for this big push towards the coastline. He was trying to persuade them to backload the planes with patients on the return flight. To increase his bargaining power, he was accompanied by a jeep full of captured Japanese equipment to use as a bartering tool in this squalid deal. So it's in my book, he talks about you know, how many bodies, how many casualties they could get on a plane for a Japanese samurai sword, or how many patients you might get on the plane if you offered them a helmet. And I actually spoke to, um, one of the men who witnessed it, because it just was shocking to me, but, but he confirmed it and he'd written about it himself and said he was there that day. So as distasteful as his task was, those actions actually saved many lives. Because the next day, um, both Nick and Bill were caring for casualties at the Saputa dressing station when it and the nearby 7th Division headquarters and the US installations nearby came under attack from Japanese fighter pilots. And the bombing and strafing killed and wounded hundreds of men, including Papuan carriers, Australian and American medical personnel, and many casualties who were lying on stretchers in the dressing station. The interesting thing was in that um, ice cream container that I showed you, there was a little hand-drawn map sketch. And I got to the bottom of it, and it was actually a sketch of what happened at Saputa on that day. And it had crosses where people were killed and where bodies were buried. So. Um, it tied in well and helped to illuminate that whole episode. So the tragedy at Saputa highlights the most obvious and ongoing weakness of the medical planning for Papua, namely its heavy reliance on aeroplanes for the delivery of medical supplies and evacuation of casualties. It takes us back to that question of priority and leadership, um, the inexcusable level of faith that was placed in aeroplanes for medical supply and evacuation, and blind faith that was placed in the ability to evacuate the casualties by air based not on experience or evidence or resources, but quite literally on a wing and a prayer. So the total Australian battle casualties killed and wounded in Papua as a result of enemy action between July 42 and January 43 is estimated at 5,866, with most of these occurring not on the Kokoda track, as most people might think, but during the battles for the beachheads around Bunagona and Sandananda between November and January. So what I find most alarming is the total number of casualties who were evacuated due to illness or disease, which was approximately 29,000. So that translates to almost five, six soldiers to every battle casualty. By the final months of 42, um, the situation militarily was improving and in some ways represent the high point of Australian military care, military medical care in Papua, when the supplies became more reliable, forward surgery saved lives, 
planes could evacuate more casualties and the policy of treating and holding the casualties in Papua was finally discontinued. And that made way for large scale sea and air evacuations back home to Australian mainland. But those eight weeks or so served to underscore that problem with the priority and the exhausted frontline medical care, medical personnel um, had to deal with the consequences of that. That's my Uncle Nick. That was taken in Lingard Hospital at Merriweather in April. And while waiting beside the Poppendetta airstrip in Papua for his own evacuation back to Port Moresby in late December 42, after spending three long months in Papua, Nick wrote in the diary that he'd kept since his days in the Middle East. And he wrote, we never want to see or hear of this part of New Guinea again. There are a lot under wooden crosses not coming back with us this trip. And he went on to explain that there are battle casualties to be flown out, so of course they go before us. There's only four of our unit get away. It's my first trip in a plane. I always said I would never get in one, but I'm pleased to hop into this one. It's a great feeling as she races down the strip and we're soon soaring over the mountain tops. The plane has to fly at least 15,000 feet to get over the gap in the Owen Stanley range. It's quite cold and misty. We certainly bless that pilot, the plane and her motors for this trip. At last we touch down on Jackson's Drome at Port Moresby. The trip takes 40 minutes. If we'd had to walk back, it would have taken us 16 days to cross the Owen Stanleys again. And on the 17th of January, the Kennedy brothers are amongst the survivors of the campaign who board the Duntroon, docked in Moresby Harbour and sailed for Australia at midday that day. And Nick wrote, well, it could have been worse. We could have been back along the track under one of those wooden crosses. As we sail out of Port Moresby, we take a last glimpse as we think of the rugged mountains of New Guinea. So that's it from me. It's not a very uplifting story, I'm sorry, but I think it's an important story. I hope you got something from it. Thank you.